Hello, Jeff Disher here again. Uh, today I'm going to do a bit of a kind of a follow up to what I was talking about with uh, programming languages, and I'm going to talk through type systems, which is an idea of organizing thoughts both in the real world and in conversation, but also in computer programs, uh, because it comes up in all of these and it kind of works the same way in all these situations. So, first of all, I'm going to go through what is a type, uh, why is a type important. Then I'm going to talk about the simple example of type systems, which is static type systems, where, where everything is very, very fixed, you know specifically what something is. Then talk about the other extreme, which is dynamic type systems, which is where everything's very fluid, you, you can't really be sure what something is until you try to use it. And just to finish up, I'm going to talk a bit about a concept called polymorphism, which is, it's, you can kind of view it as a way of getting the best of both worlds, between static and dynamic. But it, it's actually a little different than that. You hear people talk about this a lot in things like object-oriented environments. Uh, it's a popular buzzword there. But it extends beyond that. So first of all, what is a type? Well, it's really what something is. This isn't even just a, a computer programming concept. It's a This happens in the real world. You could be asking someone what time it is, and you expect them to give you a number or a, a time, uh, not just a color or something. That wouldn't make any sense. Uh, so this can even refer to things like physical objects, kind of the obvious case, but also abstract ideas. These are all types of things. You can, you can kind of refer to them and they have a logical meaning. And you know that, okay, the number five and the number six, well, they're different things, but you know they're both numbers. Uh, that type is what, what tells you how to interact with something, um, what something is. But it also tells you how to use it. You know that numbers are things you can count with. Um, colors aren't. Well, not normally at least. For example, you can drive a car. You can talk to a person. Um, this tells you how to interact with things in what we, in computer programming, refer to as its interface or the contract of interaction. So uh, something like a car exposes an interface that allows you to drive it. But a bicycle has a similar one. Uh, a good example of kind of very, very broad notion of types in language that people use is verbs and nouns you know how to use them because of the type of word they represent, or the type of idea they represent within a sentence. You know how to put them together. And this makes logical statements. So why is type important? Well, for the obvious reasons I went through, it just comes down to making sense. You know, you, you need to make sure that things actually are consistent. You can't drive a kettle. There, there's no such thing as purple o'clock. You kind of want to know what these actually are. They, that interface describing how things interact is important because otherwise it's just nonsense. And when it comes to computer programming, it matters a lot when you're doing things like finding bugs because type tells you, are you using this correctly? For example, if you're trying to say, yeah, count me the first some number of things out of this list and it's expecting you to say something like three, like give it a number. But if you give it something like purple or the sky or something, it, it's not gonna make any sense. So uh, that's where type is important because it means that you can very obviously determine that something is not being used correctly because you didn't even give it the right kind of thing. Uh, also, it can matter for improving performance. This is kind of less of a less of an important feature and more just an interesting side effect uh, because types have restrictions. You can say something like, "Well, this number can only be, you know, from one to ten, or this value can only be true or false." And as long as you actually have a very uh, well-defined notion of what those things are and you can prove to the compiler that when I say that this this has to be one thing or the other it is one thing or the other it cannot possibly be anything else then there's a bunch of corner cases that the compiler can ignore so this can improve performance but again that's kind of a, a just a side effect not really the purpose so looking at this from the most obvious case we'll look at static types so these are known at the time that you give them to the compiler you explicitly state when you're writing the code this is what this thing is, this is what I'm expecting to interact with, and this is the capabilities I need all these things to have so that I can actually implement the algorithm I'm trying to write. So this means that you can actually catch the bugs before you even run it. You just give it to the compiler, which takes the, the text of your program and turns it into something you can run on a CPU, and it'll say immediately, you're using this stuff wrong. It can't possibly be right. So this is really good because it means that you get to catch that bug immediately. You don't even have to run the program and you can find it. So this means that you get limited ambiguity. When you're actually reading code to figure out what it does, 
if you're using the types very consistently or, and correctly and rigidly, then you can actually, it's very obvious what you're doing. If you have a function that's called add, and it says, okay, well, I require two numbers. It's like, okay, well, it's probably going to add those together. Whereas if it was just add, but you didn't give it anything, you didn't, it didn't, you didn't know what the types were, well, what happens if you give it you know, two names? Is it going to try and add those together, or is it going to stick them together, or what? There's, there's ambiguity there. Uh, so that makes it easier to read code. It makes your intent more obvious. So this is why it's, uh, it's useful for situations like that, where you're even just looking at things. Um, not even trying to run it or anything, just as a human trying to understand it. Because remember, the real world has type. Computer programs that don't have type are confusing to humans for the same reason that not understanding what anything around you meant would be confusing. The problem with this is, though, that it takes a lot of extra work to formalize these things. Uh, now, this is well worth the effort if you're making something very large or something that you're going to be working on for a long time. But if you're just quickly uh, kind of banging out a little prototype to prove an idea, having to go through all the extra work of telling the compiler, yes, I know what I'm doing, I'm creating all these, these descriptions of the formalizing what's called the interfaces between things uh, so that the compiler agrees with you that it's correct, that just takes more time. Uh, sometimes that can get in the way because you might want to just prove something out quickly and only take a few hours as opposed to like a day of actually writing it up properly. So this means that it's going to take longer to prototype because things like interfaces have to be explicitly created and defined. <clears throat> so the other side of that, kind of going to the opposite extreme, is dynamic type systems. These are known only when running. This is again more like my example of you have a function called add that says it takes two things. The compiler does not know what those things are. So strain you know, the, the ambiguity in, in the meaning of what happens when you get different kinds of things, what happens if they're not numbers, uh, that comes into play here. It means that bugs are found late. In fact, it might be possible that the use cases that you have that you're actually testing most frequently because they're, they're the things that are most useful, for example, uh, they might not expose a bug. It might be some kind of less less obvious case that comes in through a weird, uh, a weird path that uses something with a different type incorrectly. And you're only going to find that because you actually run that path. So this has increased testing load quite a bit uh, and moves a lot of complexity into actually testing it. But it also means that you're going to have a harder time understanding it when you're looking at a large system because you didn't say what anything was. So this is, of course, useful for prototyping because you can very quickly bang out something quick and you can just tell the compiler, yeah, yeah, don't worry about the correctness. I know in my mind what everything is. As systems get large, uh, if you're saying that, you're lying. So because of the lack of formalization, it's useful for doing that. But again, it really only works when the problem is still small. In fact, dynamic type languages, uh, things like PHP or JavaScript, for example, as people start making larger systems like that, they usually start coming up with ways of adding types to them because otherwise it becomes really hard to understand what's going on. And really this comes down to kind of the, the ultimate question uh, and the reason why even if you had a perfect way of doing this, it still wouldn't be obvious what was going on. Is you'd have to say, okay, well, is the number five and the name five the same thing? Like, are they? It's, it's even an open question. It's kind of up to you. And every language has slightly different interpretations of how to answer that question. Um, so it's, this is kind of the, the fundamental question behind these, these issues and why it's not obvious to just say, oh, well, we just need to think harder. It's like, no, it, it's actually not obvious. So polymorphism of, is, one could argue it's a way of trying to get the best of both worlds, or at least you can implement a system that gives you some amount of the best of both worlds in it. Um, and so I'll tell you how that works. It comes down to the idea that we talked about before how type represents how you use something, what its interface for interaction is. Well, polymorphism allows you to say, okay, well, we'll create an interface for how to interact with some kind of type. But then we'll say, okay, different types, completely different types can uh, say that they expose this interface. So then we don't care what actual type they are. We just care that they have this interface, that they're kind of exposing this way of interacting because if we're writing some generic code, that's what we want. We don't care what it is. We just care that it can do the thing we need it to do. So for example, you can talk to a person or a cat. Be wary, of course, that there's going to be differences in implementation. 
The cat is less likely to understand you and will probably not respond in any human language. Whereas a person has a much better chance of knowing what's going on and actually taking an action in response to what you said. But you can talk to both of them. So this allows the details of the specific types to be ignored. And this makes it easier to sort of build generic components. Because, like I said, you don't care what they actually are. Right? You don't care that you know a bike, a car, uh, a bus are all different things. All you care is that they expose an ability for me to get from point to point, a transportation interface. Right? That's, that's one example of how this makes sense in the real world. Um, and it comes up a lot in software, especially as things get large and you want to have kind of generic components that you can just refer to and not worry about the details of. That's how you do it. You say that, oh, well, I, that the generic component just says, you have to give me something which has this capability or this interface. And then you, you can come up with whatever you want in your own code and just use this. And as long as you're implementing it in a way that it expects, you'll get the right behavior. So you see this come up a lot, especially in very large systems um, and systems that have a lot of reusable or kind of what's called library components. So anyway, uh, I kind of want to do this talk because it seems like this kind of a pendulum that goes back and forth between whether uh, people like static types or dynamic types. And right now they're sort of in the dynamic type camp and it's slowly starting to swing back towards static types if you look through things like uh, Dart or uh, Hack, uh, languages like that. Um, so it seems like something worth pointing out because I often kind of hear things that are very, very one-sided opinions in this world and it seems like, well, there's there's something to be said for both sides of it, and it's it's an interesting problem, and there is no one way of looking at it because, you know, as I said, this it's an idea that that has relevance within the real world. Sure, there's it's easy to hack something out in something dynamic, but it's you kind of want things to make sense like they do when they're static. So, it's it's an interesting uh, kind of weird dichotomy that exists, um, and it seems like about every ten or fifteen years the pendulum tends to go one way or the other. So. Anyway, we'll see where things go with that next, but um, send me an email if you have any questions or, or reply to this, uh, this video here, or subscribe, or even just uh, contact me if you want me to talk about something new, because I'm always interested in suggestions. So anyway, thanks. Bye.